Welcome. My name is Chang Qingxiang. I work with World Bank South Asia uh, sort of collection team. Um, this session is a health insurance for the poor. General tax uh, finance uh, health insurance for the poor program increasingly become a, a use as a means for two purposes. The first purpose is to provide a financial protection against the impoverished from the out-of-pocket spending in the, case, in the event of uh, uh, sickness uh, uh, and other health events. The second objective uh, is always uh, is to improve the health care utilization access for the poor uh, vulnerable groups who usually actually uh, don't have the same equal access um, opportunity. In the past decade, uh, Great amount of knowledge and best practice emerged from a number of well-designed and well-implemented health insurance for the poor programs. I think there are strong evidence that uh, these programs indeed improve service utilization and protect beneficiary uh, financially by reducing out-of-pocket spending. However, the evidence on the other potential impacts, such as the improvement of quality of service, and the health outcome are still weak and inconclusive. But if this health insurance of the role in, in achieving uh, universal health care is recognized uh, widely by policymakers. For example, the World, World Health Organization 2010 report specifically dedicated to, to health uh, financing, health system financing, passed to universal coverage, consider health insurance a promising means uh, for universal health uh, care coverage. To design and implement a, subs uh, a sustainable and effective health insurance program is very difficult, much more than an average sort of protection uh, program. I think this session will devote some time uh, on, this, on the design issue and the implementation challenges. Today we actually were very honored to have two distinguished speakers. Let me introduce them to you. Um, Mr. Stroop, uh, first on my left, he's the uh, Director General of Labor Welfare and Additional Secretary at the uh, Ministry of Labor Employment, Government India. He has work, he has, he's working on social security policy and the programs targeting specifically for the informal sector or we, what we call here an organized sector workers, including RSBY. And be before becoming a de driving force behind RSBY, he has a whole a, a number of uh, important positions at both uh, national and state level positions. In the past two years, he has been selected by Indian mainstream newspapers as one of a few action hero and the policy changers because of his contribution in, in uh, pushing, promoting the social security um, benefits for the uh, informal sectors. And then Mr. Ridwan Kotipak, further left, he's the head of the Department of Social Inclusion and uh, Income Distribution of Ministry of Development, Turkey. He has been involved in social security and social assistance policy and program uh, planning and implementation uh, uh, actions in, in Turkey. Um, we have about an hour and a half altogether. I would like to have uh, each uh, speaker to keep within four, uh, 30 minutes. And the first, I'd like to invite Mr. Kotpak to speak about the Turkey's green card program. Please. Thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, first of all, this is a great honor for me to be here. And I should thank all the responsible persons who is organizing this great forum. I learned a lot from other countries' experiences. And now I will try to share Turkish experience on health insurance for poor. 
In my presentation, I will give some background information on poverty, social security uh, coverage, health indicates, and social expenditures. And I will talk on green card program, which is a uh, health insurance program for poor people in Turkey. And uh, after then, I will give brief information about universal health insurance that we began on January 2012. Uh, I will focus on targeting mechanisms, local committees, and new database program, and I will finish my presentation with uh, challenges, lessons learned. In the last decade, Turkey faced a good, sustainable political uh, progress, and also we got good sustainability on financial economical issues. We got good progress on uh, inflation rates, uh, interest rates, and also budget deficits. It, it allows us to uh, invest on so more social expenditures. For power trades, from 2003 to, to 2010, under $2.15 has been decreased from 2.4% to 0.2%. And for under $4.2 per day, from 2003 to 2010, again, it decreased from 24% to 3.7%. Unemployment rate is almost 10%. We got good progress on power elevation and unemployment, but they are still high if we compare them between, with OECD or EU. Unregistered employment is high. It's 42% in 2011. And contributory social insurance coverage is 85% in 2011. Let's have a look for the contributory social security uh, coverage. Total population is 74.7 million. There are almost 10 million public employees, 38 million private employees, and 15.4 self-employed. And for the green card holders, the percentage is 12.7. It's almost 9.5 million. For the social expenditures, as I mentioned, that we could be able to invest on more uh, social expenditures. Total social expenditures from 2000 to 2010 has been increased from 10.6 to 16.7. For education, it increased from 3% to 3.7%. And for health, it increased from 26 to 4.5%. And social protection expenditures also increased from 5% to 8.5%. For the green card expenditures, increase is more than six times. There are a lot of studies on relation between better health and poverty, income distribution, intergenerational transmission of poverty. I will give on some uh, examples. Uh, individuals with better health care can er earn more. Healthier individuals invest more on educational activities. Um, in healthier societies, economic growth is higher especially for women with better health care facilities, leads higher growth in developing countries. For the health indicators of Turkey, we got, again, significant improvements uh, in the last decades. Life expectancy has increased from 66 years in 1990 to 71.5 uh, years in 2006 and 74.3 years years in 2010. Infant mortality rate has decreased from 55.4 per thousand in 1990 to 22.6 in 2006 and 10.1 in 2010. As I mentioned, Turkey uh, has increased its total health expenditures and also we expanded our health coverage for poor people. Uh, we, on, we didn't uh, only uh, expand the coverage, also we expanded the benefits for the green card program. And there has been a huge reform on health with Health Transition pro Project with World Bank. As family medicine or reconstruction of the system, 
We are not only talking with the Montrebis, we are also making some reforms on social security, uh, health, and also for social services and assistance programs. Health insurance for poor. Green card program started at 1992, and we integrated green card with universal health insurance in 2012. Turkey made a huge reform on social security in 2006. There were three different insurance schemes where different obligations and benefits. In 2006, we unified three programs in social security institution with same obligations and benefits. And universal health insurance has been targeted at 2006. All the population, regardless of the premium they pay, will benefit from the same high-quality health services. It was targeted at 2006. The preparation for universal health insurance was started earlier than, of course. We wanted to integrate green card program in 2007 to universal health insurance, but we could not able to complete the database for income test until 2011. So I will give more information about the database. It's important for us. For the green card, uh, we started green card on 1992. Green card aims to provide health benefits to the poor who are not covered through formal means of health insurance and are unable to pay for health services. Having per capita household income of less than one-third of the minimum wage threshold could be eligible for coverage under green card program. Program is funded from the state budget. This is very important, state budget. So this is not a uh, premium-based social ins insurance scheme. Uh, Ministry of uh, Health transfers the uh, uh, poor person's uh, health care costs directly to the uh, hospitals. Uh, annual estimated budget transferred from Minister of uh, Finance to Minister of Health budget. Uh, for the monitoring and evaluation, there is not a uh, different evaluation system for green card. We only have whole health system. For SolidNet, uh, Minister of Health makes uh, evaluates the health outcomes and medulla system with social security institution, they are evaluating health records. And for the poverty situation, uh, integrated social assistance and services uh, program database and home visits are made. And also for the auditing system, both uh, ministries has their own inspectors and auditors to make sampling and audit all the uh, hospitals and the healthcare services. For the entitlements of the green card, uh, from until 2004, program only covered inpatient treatment costs and uptake was low. After 2003, we expanded the program's coverage and benefits. In 2003, there were only 2.5 million green card holders and only 20% of the lowest income quantile has been covered. And 0.33% of total health spending was on uh, green card expenditures. In 2004, benefits under the program were expanded to cover outpatient as well as inpatient services at Minister of Health and University Hospitals. In 2005, outpatient prescription drugs were included in their benefits package and then the uh, coverage has been increased dramatically. In 2006, it's increased to 8.3 million, and in 2011, it increased to 9.5 million. And I will talk about the targeting mechanisms more. This is a uh, great table that we could able to see the targeting mechanism is good. On 2003, uh, total coverage is 4%. When we come to 2008, it is 14%. There is a huge increase in coverage, but when we look at the targeting system from 2003 to 2008, we see that uh, the coverage increased in the most poorest quantiles. For the first poorest uh, quantile, it increased from 12 to 62. 
in, from 2003 to 2008. And for the second quantile, it increased from 8 to 34. Uh, and for the richest quantiles, as you see, there is not so many uh, uh, bad usage of the green card. The entitlements of the green card and universal health insurance as of 2012, the basic benefits package is very comprehensive and covers health service expenditures for the following. Medical consultation, diagnostic tests, treatment, dressing, tooth extraction, dental prothesis, and eyeglasses in outpatient treatment in healthcare facilities, inpatient treatment in patient public hospitals, and hospitalization for emergency cases and treatment. Green cards beneficiaries are only covered for services received in public facilities at all three levels of care and can only use private facilities in emergency cases. There is co-payments, and these co-payments are same for green cards holders and other insured insurance schemes. When we look at the percentage of the expenditures, as health expenditures and GDP, again from 2002 to 2011, it increased from, for the percent, for percent of public health expenditures, increased from 4% to 9%, and percent of GDP it increased from 0.15 to 0.40 from 2002 to 2011. Out of pocket expenditures, Turkey, in Turkey traditionally, out of pocket expenditures is not so high. But we, again, we can see there is a decrease on out of pocket health spending. Total expenditure on health per capita in U.S. dollars has been increased from 95 to 678 from 1995 to 2010. While the total expenditures increased, out-of-pocket health uh, spending as a share of total health spending has been decreased from 29.7 to 16 percent in 2010. Uh, Impoverishing effect of out-of-pocket expenditures. I will not go so deeply to these figures, but as I said, traditionally, out-of-pocket expenditures are not so high, and so impoverishing effects are not so high. From two because before, two before the expansion of the program, uh, without uh, from green card, local communities were paying the health care uh, expenditures of the poor people. So after the expansion, we can see some uh, progress uh, on uh, uh, impoverishing effect. It was 0.8% in 2003, and it decreased to 0.3% in 2008. For the green card, green card enrollment, there is a hybrid targeting scheme, central determined rules, and used local information. Income tests are done by National Integrated Social Services and Assistance Program database, and home visits made by social workers of local communities to check if the data are true or not. So, you know, as I mentioned in my first uh, PowerPoint, unregistered employment and unregistered uh, incomes is uh, high for Turkey. So to say their home is very crucial for us. So uh, for the tar targeting mechanisms, as I m mentioned, as hybrid, there are local communities, and we are using central database. For the local communities, we call them social assistance and solidarity foundations. Home visits are done by the social works of these local foundations. Local foundations are autonomous foundations, not public entities, and not local branches of Ministry of Family and Social Policy. The decision-making body of the local foundation is the Board of Trustees. The president is the governor or the sub-governor in the districts. In all the districts of Turkey, we have these committees. And in this community, there is mayor, local directors of ministries, village and district headmen, NGO-based entities, and charitable citizens. Foundations mainly use resources transferred from Minister of Family and Social Policy for their usage. 
Applications are evaluated and responded by the local foundations in the local level in accordance with central regulations. And their uh, auditing are made by Minister of Family and Social Policy and also with the related institutions. And this is important that we, we could able to integrate our green card program into universal health insurance. Uh, we made a new uh, comprehensive uh, database system. It is online working. All the registered information from the 14 different institutions gathered in 10 seconds with identity number. Only you are giving your identity number and we are receiving all the information of you in 10 seconds. If you are registered employee or if you are receiving any benefits from any kind of cash transfers, if you have a car or if you are receiving unemployment insurance, something like that. I will give more information about it in the next slide. The aims of that project to develop an household approach by integrating information database related to social assistance and universal health insurance, to provide knowledge sharing and active control between databases, to activate decisions of social assistance by directing the social assistance information with integrated approach and to provide fair, fair this is important, fair resource allocation to support social security policies with the decision support system. This is the system. There are a lot of institutions related to this system. There is social security institution for premium based social insurance and Minister of Labor is responsible from unemployment insurance. And there are lots of different cash transfer programs to poor people like child payments, conditional cash transfers, old age payments, disabled people, etc. So with this online system, all the information about incomes and also whether the family has a car or a property or land are determined. And also, how many per person is living in house, new births that marriage can be controlled online. For the universal health insurance implementation, we started in January 1 on 2012. Uh, funds for green card holders are transferred from Minister of Finance to the Social Security Institution. Individuals are classified into one of four groups, G0 to G3, depending on their income. I will give more information again on this issue. Whose income vary across the year have to apply monthly. The amount of their premiums can be adjusted accordingly. And information from various databases to populate information on a family's income. If changes in income are identified before an insurer provides a self-statement, then the system reruns and re-identifies the household income and sets new premium levels where appropriate. If the system notes that the number of household members have changed due to new births, deaths, marriage and divorce, etc., recorded in public database, the per capita household income is revised automatically to reflect this and appropriate premium levels are set. So, as I mentioned, G0 to G3, if the income level for person is less than one third of the minimum wage, so we decide that this person is poor, so the premiums are paid by government. If the income level of one person is between one, point one of third of minimum wage and, min uh, and minimum wage between, the person pays one third of the minimum wage insurance payment. So if the person earns between minimum wage and two times of minimum wage, the person pays normal minimum wage health insurance payment. And if the person earns more than two times of minimum wage, then the person pays two times of the minimum page wage uh, health insurance premiums. Uh, as I said before, that eligibility lasted for one year. As you know, this year almost half of the green card holders' income tests and home visits completed, and the results are coherent with previous studies. So, as you see from the table, almost 90 percentage of the green card holders determined as G0 poor people, 
and 10 percentage are determined income level of uh, between one third of minimum wage and minimum wage. So the almost uh, hundred of them again will be under the coverage of universal health insurance and their premiums will be paid by the government. Main challenges and solutions. Challenges unknown total target population numbers, double counting, uncoordinating coordination among related institutions and solutions. When we are talking on social policy issues, they are all multidimensional, they are all horizontal and interrelated. So the solutions must be in inter-integrated form. There should be financial stability and political will. Uh, we made good progress on our health and poverty and also employment uh, records, but we made uh, a lot of important reforms uh, related to this issue, we made a good reform, important reform for health with health transition project and social security reform in 2006. There was enormous work for that uh, unification. And also, uh, lastly, we created, we established our Minister of Family and Social Policy. All the related institutions are gathered under one uh, ministry and investment on long-term implications. While we were started to prepare uh, universal health insurance in 2003, and implementation could only be enabled in 2012. And database infrastructure, it is very important for uh, our countries. If we didn't have this kind of uh, databases, not only for the social uh, payments, for education system, for health system, for car owners, for land owners, for every system. If we have databases, so it's possible to uh, control all the system easily. Uh, poverty culture, unregistered employment, fair system, better opportunities for whole population. While seven, eight years before, when we are making, making meetings on social policy area, we, are, we were always talking about uncoordination about institutions, double countings. And some poor people were receiving uh, more funds from public institutions, and some of them would not able to receive any money. It was, it was creating an unfair system. And also this, this creates uh, unregistered employment. So we are already not uh, got, got get good achievements on unregistered employment, but we are working on unregistered employment, and for better opportunities, especially for health and for all other social means. Turkey is working on regional disparities. This is another priority, future priority for us. We are trying to decrease uh, regional disparities. So thank you very much. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, uh, please hold off your question. I think there are a lot actually uh, um, spoke about. Um, next, uh, may I request Ms. Roop to speak about the uh, Indian's uh, national health insurance uh, scheme? It's there. I think it's there. So it's there. Good afternoon, everybody. I think it's a difficult task to be the last speaker of the day. But the advantage is that only those that are really dedicated are around. So they will lend me their ears. Thank you very much for staying back. Uh, this is the brief structure of presentation. Um, Indian context, uh, like any other country, is different from other countries. So a brief flavor of the, what the context is. Um, I shouldn't be talking about the second point, because I think all of us do agree that there's a need for social security. But I'll just touch upon it. Then this, uh, the third point is raging. Uh, in India, there's a huge debate going on, whether, they sh whether health insurance is the instrument to take health care forward. So I'll touch upon that. Um, then I'll talk briefly about what the scheme is, this national health insurance scheme, the Rashti Swasthya Bhima Yojana, what exactly it is. Um, what are the initial challenges? Because you heard Turkey just now who have traveled the distance. We are still traveling the distance. So we are facing a lot of challenges. Probably some of the answers will emerge during the course of discussions today. We've been learning a lot as we interact with those that have already traveled that 
distance. Uh, then briefly, what, is, what has happened so far under the scheme? How has the scheme been perceived by those who are either affected or those that are observing the scheme from outside? We obviously will say that the scheme is great. As I often say that uh, the baker will always call his uh, cake the best around. But how has it been perceived by others? Uh, I will spend some time on the potential of the smart card. I think we, we do believe that this can change the way we think. This can change the way we deliver social services. And if there are, what are these lessons for some other countries? Now, this is the Indian context. 94% in the informal sector, an organized sector where you don't have an identified employer. The problem that we face in India is to how to define them, how to locate them, how to register them, and how to benefit them. We can come up with a brilliant scheme, but you won't be able to locate the guy. So that's a challenge. And the number is huge, 430 million. So that's, that's the challenge. That's the first challenge. However, it is our belief that as the economy is growing, as uh, growing till very recently, till 8% per annum, how do we reach out to this pure? And we do believe that if the growth is not an inclusive one, we are in serious trouble. So how to share the benefit of what is happening around? And that is our belief that there should be uh, an effort towards providing social security to this, uh, to this section of the society, which is huge. And it is in this context that the country came up with a legislation in 2008 uh, calling for social security for Hong Kong. These are some of the indicators that give you how the economy has grown over a period of time, where we were and where we are. It is an impressive growth. But the problem is that this growth is not being shared by all. And if that doesn't happen, as we keep saying, there would be serious trouble. So we, we, we have been talking in terms of trying to do a few things about employment security. I think the first day of the conference was dedicated to the employment security aspect, so I'll not talk about it. Then health security is something which I'll talk about, the maternity security and the old age security. This is what we would have discussed perhaps on the first day, the NREGA and the Rashtriya Swas Bhima Yojana is something which I'll discuss today. And this is a part of the larger legislation that was brought about in 2008 that talks about health security, life security, and old age pension. The country has huge financial commitment to this. And if you look at the NREGA, almost 10% of the outlay is going, going to the NREGA. Again, you would have discussed this. RSPY is a very small component of the social security paradigm that we have. Now, when we talk in terms of why health insurance, if you look at how it is, has evolved, I mean, this has changed a bit. But this was in 2004. Past few years have brought about a sea change in this. So the, those that are insured in India are the rich, or were the rich. Now, of course, it's much, much different. And this is a slide which makes us understand, and it is now proven world over, that health shocks are one of the primary causes of impoverishment. And as I was telling somebody in the morning, to me, if a poor man goes to a hospital, he dies. He either dies in the hospital, or when he comes out, he's under so much burden of debt that he is unable to recover. But that's, that's the impact of a health shock. And probably these were the reasons why the Prime Minister announced that there should be health insurance scheme. Now, this was the point that I was mentioning. There is a huge debate raging in India today that whether we should continue with the supply-side management of health care, as we had done for the decades, where the money keeps getting pumped into the public health care system, and we keep hoping that that will deliver, or we experiment with the demand side management of health financing, wherein we put the money in the hands of the beneficiary and allow him to choose the point of getting the health service. Now, when we started thinking about the demand side financing, we were told that the whole system provides free health care. So why do you want to add on to it? But the question was whether that was actually providing free health care or, for that matter, whether it was providing adequate health care, forget free. There was a huge question mark on that, and perhaps that was the reason why the policymakers thought that it was high time to think in terms of using insurance company as intermediaries between the service providers and those that are going to get the service. Now, I won't go into the details of it. This actually provides a justification of why intermediation of an insurance company is required. 
Now, there is a school of thought which says that, okay, if you want to bring in private sector health care, let the government directly fund them. Why do you need an insurance intermediation in between? What is the need of it? You pick up certain private sector health care providers and you have public sector health care providers and on the basis of the health care that is being provided, set up a corpus of fund and let it flow to the, those, either the public sector hospitals or private sector hospital. And the question that I have asked to them is, what is the incentive for a bureaucrat sitting in that, who's managing that fund, to see that the fund is going to the right place for the right cause? There is no business interest. If you have an insurance company, the insurance company takes the risk. They are paid a fixed premium. So it is in their business interest to see or to control the expenditures that are there. And this is coming true because you can actually control expenditure if the risk is taken by a business entity which then thinks twice before it and it sets up systems as it has done in case of RSBY to control the expenditure there. It's not to restrict it but to see whether the expenditure that is being incurred. To me, that is the rationale for having insurance company as an intermediate. Only uh, time will tell whether what we say is right or wrong, but that's what we are. Now let me come to Rashtriya Swast Bhima and National, National Health Insurance Scheme. Now I must admit that uh, when we were given this task of doing health insurance, uh, at that point in time, and I still am in labor, that is the Ministry of Labor, and in pain, uh, in Ministry of Labor not much used to happen, because everything goes through the tripartite route, where everyone states his point of view and resolutions are few and far between. So when we were asked to do this scheme, uh, RSPY, we didn't have much of a clue of what health insurance is, how it is to happen. In most of the countries, it is the health ministry that does it. Here, for some reason, it was not the health ministry and we were asked to do this job. But I think it was a blessing in disguise that we didn't know much because we started from scratch. We felt that let's look at the consumer, let's look at the ultimate beneficiary and evolve the scheme from that. You know, most of the government schemes, someone gets a brainwave, it's announced, and then a scheme is formulated. No one really looks at the beneficiary who's ultimately going to be the sufferer. So in this case, I think more by accident than by design, we looked at the beneficiary, and these were the three characteristics of the beneficiary. He was poor. And hence, whatever scheme that we are going to evolve, we couldn't have asked him to pay upfront and then claim the money from the insurance company. This was not that big a problem because there were indeed a few cashless health insurance schemes around the world and in India as well. But the second point was very important. Most of these guys who were trying to benefit were illiterate. Now, if you look at the insurance documents, they, they, they finally printed and much of it is not understood. And you could not have asked these guys to sign and all. So to make this scheme paperless continues to be a challenge because even today there is no paperless health insurance scheme in the world. We are attempting to make this scheme paperless, and I'll share with you how far we have traveled in terms of making the scheme paperless. The third could be true of a large number of developing countries. A large number of unorganized sector workers travel distance in search of employment. Now, no scheme in India, including the NREJ that you would have discussed day before yesterday, is the benefit available to him if he goes out of his district. If he goes out of the district, even the subsidized food grains are not available to him. Now, I couldn't have asked this guy that please don't fall ill when you go to another location. The chances are that he would fall ill when he travels outside to an unknown terrain. And hence, the scheme benefits had to be portable. This was the biggest challenge. That how do you make scheme cashless? How do you make the scheme paperless? And how do you make the scheme portable? Now, this is in brief what the scheme is. It provides a insurance cover of $650, and dollar keeps, value keeps changing, so probably today it would be around more realistically $600. Um, this might appear to be a small amount in the Western context, but in the Indian context it appears to be it's an adequate amount and it's doing the job. The second point was more on account of practical reasons. We couldn't have had a, a, a pre-existing disease not covered because there was no way to ascertain what were the pre-existing diseases. This did impact the premium a bit, but for purely practical reasons, we've had pre-existing diseases in the scheme. Then initially, when we started the scheme, the scheme was limited to inpatient care. Now, of course, we are experimenting with outdoor patient care, but to begin with, it was for inpatient care for the simple reason that in our limited understanding of health insurance, moral hazard is one thing that can make the scheme fail. 
and in op care we we did feel that it would have been difficult to control these moral hazards as compared to inpatient care uh, it's a cashless cover for hospitalization with virtually no exception almost everything is covered there's a provision of smart card i'll 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 dwell upon it subsequently uh, you have provision for pre hospitalized one day pre hospitalization and five day post hospitalization there is a small amount of transportation allowance that is given the funding is 75% by the central government and 25% by the state government but what is important is that we do charge a small token amount as a registration fee from the beneficiary it was in fact there was a lot of criticism when we did that and bureaucrats are always pushed on on such issues they said you bureaucrats sit in air conditioned rooms how do you expect these people to pay this registration fee so far in the country no fee was charged for anything that was being delivered it's a different matter whether it was being delivered or not in this particular case we insisted that we we're going to charge this and this has now become a usp of this scheme why because when you pay an amount you treasure what is given to you you value it and then you can demand those services it is not gratis so they can we have a couple of court cases this these guys have said we paid for it and we not getting the services so this is the potential of it and it's working well and the entire administrative cost which you see in the next point is born out of this 30 rupees that is collected so in the scheme the only cost that government bears is the premium cost and that includes the cost of the smart card now this smart card is owned by the central government distributed by the insurance company possessed by the individual it's a very unique experiment that we're doing this is a typical smart card the white space that you see there is where the photograph of the head of the family is positioned in the chip that you have here you have the biometric data of all the family members five of them you have the photograph of the family and other family details and a credit of 30000 which keeps getting debited as you go and as you use them there were huge initial challenges no one believed that this scheme could or would happen and hence uh, initially the states and stakeholders everyone but the biggest problem that we continue to face today it's not that big a problem earlier it was a huge problem was the database then the awareness level it continues to be a challenge moral hazard i have already touched upon earlier but the final point is a very important one for anything to sustain you have to have the stakeholders believe that what is being done by them has value for them and one reason why rsby continue to sustain itself and i can go around and talking to and keep attending conferences is that the stakeholders have come to realize that's a winning module for them so they are participating actively in it to make it happen so every stakeholders interest is to make it happen because this they think that they are winning in it now there were these were the initial challenges there were insurance related challenges there were information technology related challenges and i think the biggest challenge was the third one again to use this concept of marketing within the bureaucracy was a very difficult thing no one understood what in 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 governments normally you come up with a scheme you have the targets you monitor them keep monitoring them so every time they used to ask what is your monitoring mechanism i said we don't monitor who are we to monitor we are not wiser those uh, more wiser than those that are implementing the scheme and why should we monitor if the stakeholder perceives an interest in the scheme i don't really need to monitor in this in the traditional sense so when i went to the planning commission and i told them that we don't have targets in the scheme in the traditional sense that how do we monitor how many people go to the hospital or how many people should go to the hospital we can't have a target of people going to the hospitals so we didn't have targets and i'll explain to you why because this is perhaps the first ever business model for a social sector scheme and i'll ex again explain this to you in this scheme the amount that is given to insurance company is a multiple of number of smart cards that they issue so i don't have to have a target it is in their business interest to issue as many smart cards as possible to cover as many families as possible and as i will subsequently tell you that they cannot repeat cannot issue a smart card to a wrong person we have a full proof system as far as that is concerned similarly hospitals have a business interest in entertaining these people uh, in fact we have a serious problem in hospitals entertaining too many people on occasions so that's another issue but nonetheless they have a business interest in not chasing these people out now how is this scheme different let me spend a couple of minutes on this i think this is the first ever scheme to use it applications on such a large scale you know each of these smart card that i showed you is actually printed in the village and handed over across the counter in the village itself why did we do that because there's no other way to ensure that the card reaches him you and i have a postal address most of these people do not have an address if you were to print somewhere at the back end and post it across to him half of it will not reach him and that's the only way to ensure ensure that he 
gets the card. So this is how it, and it's not only there, even otherwise in the hospitals, he just walks in with his smart card, the biometric data is matched, he gets his treatment, he walks away, this data is captured automatically, every day it gets transmitted to a central server, and from some, that central server, the insurance company settles the claim electronically with the hospitals, no paper. Everything through the electronic system. It's fairly transparent. And not only is it transparent, we are able to see it. And we don't really need to monitor it because we set up triggers and this entire data runs through those triggers and throws up very interesting things. Again, I'll come to that later on. To me, I think the USP of the scheme is what is mentioned at point number two. I think it is for the first time in this country that a BPL family is actually empowered. And what do you mean by empowerment? The family makes a choice with regard to the hospital that he or she can visit. He decides whether he wants to go to this public hospital, this private hospital. It's his choice. In no other scheme does he have a choice. In PDS, he is tied down to a shop. He goes to that shop. In NREGA, he's tied up to a project. He goes to a project. He does, if something goes wrong there, he's in trouble. In this case, he can go. And that's his empowerment. I have already spoken about the business model part of it. Let me take a moment to explain to you what is the scheme management system. As I said, when this card is issued in the field, there is a government official sitting there with another smart card issued by us. That smart card has the biometric data of the officer. He, with his smart card, certifies that the man standing in front of the laptop is the one whose name is appearing on the laptop. He puts the card in his slot, his thumb impression, signals from his card flow to the card of the beneficiary, only do then does the card become functional. And the data from the card of the beneficiary flows to the card of field key officer, that officer sitting there. This data is downloaded for making payments to the insurance company. No paper. Absolutely foolproof. Of the 33 million cards that we've issued, not a single one has been issued to a wrong person. And similarly, we have a key management system in the hospital, where only an authorized person who has a smart card issued by us can deduct the amount that is there in the chip of the card of the beneficiary. It's a very simple front end. Back end, there are 11 sets of software that are making it happen. It's paperless, and the card is valid throughout the country. This is a typical. Uh, laptop, you have the uh, printer there, you have the biometric scanner as, as well as the f camera. It can be carried in a small box and it can go from village to village and it can run on a battery. You don't have to have regular power supply. It started in a very small way in two states and now it's almost pan-India and as I speak to you, the Andhra Pradesh pink that you see there will go green tomorrow as we start launch the RSPY tomorrow in Andhra Pradesh as well. I could have done it green today, but it's happening tomorrow. Had this presentation been tomorrow, I would have changed the color. Now, it's, it's card issued are now 33 million, 110 million people. Approximately 4.3 million people have actually swiped the card in the hospitals and got the benefit. So the technology and the processes are working. Almost every state is on board. And there are 14 insurance companies into it, 10 of them private sector and four public sector. The initial trends have been very, very encouraging. There has been an improvement in the access to health care. This is the slide. If you look at the NSS 60 for poorest, 40%, the access was 1.7%. It has gone up to two, one percentage point increase in healthcare access. This has improved further. Actually, this is last year's data, and this has improved further. Then public sector hospitals are competing with the private sector hospital to improve. This is a very, very interesting development because the problem here in India is that the public sector hospital, the doctors get their salaries, and they feel that 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 is what they should get, and thereafter they spend the time elsewhere. This has somehow induced in a couple of states for them to stay in the public hospitals, because the money that comes from the insurance company to these public hospitals stays in the hospital, of which 25% can be shared by the team of the doctors that have attended to the patient, and rest of the 75% is being used to upgrade the infrastructure. This is being looked into very seriously, and if it does work, I think we would have solved a major problem. Then. The scheme has penetrated extremist area, the Naxal areas. We have now discovered this is the only scheme that has gone into these Naxal areas. A couple of teams, our teams, smart card teams were abducted, kept in captivity for two days. They understood the scheme. And those of you who understand Hindi will understand what I'm going to say now. They said, Theek se karna wana goli mar denge. So that's, that's what they that will we'll, we'll shoot you if you don't work properly because you, there's a brilliant scheme. These are the Naxals who want the scheme for them. Then. Uh, the gender impact, we didn't, we didn't, a lot of it that has happened, we didn't th think that it would happen. Because suddenly the UN women has woken up, they're inviting me now. Next week I'll be going to Bangkok to explain to them. Amazing impact. Now today, women are outnumbering men. No, we didn't know that this would happen. 
there's a huge pent up demand and we've discovered now that in poor families and even richer families the first charge on the money available is that of the head of the family then is the children and poor woman is the last one so they were suffering over the years and in some of the districts what has happened is initially there was spurt in hysterectomy cases and we were shocked what is this going on but now it's it's come down after the second and third year it's come down which means that the pent up demand was getting met but there are let me let me tell you there are some misuses and abuses in this sense which i'll allude to later on then states have found value in the scheme they are topping up the scheme beyond 30000 so you have states like himachal pradesh they've gone from 500 dollars to 1500 dollars as the limit and they are footing the premium some states have gone ahead and universalized rspy which means they've gone much gone much beyond poor people it is now available to everyone in the state of chatisgarh and meghalaya they say it's so there is they they they, they probably perceive a lot of value the last point uh, you know the there are independent groups private sector groups they want to join the scheme they want to pay the entire premium this is a very interesting development because they perceive value in the scheme and they say they are spending more as an insurance premium in their existing insurance schemes they want to close down those schemes and they want to write this platform a decision has to be taken by the government and of course there is a disease profiling that is possible in a couple of districts epidemics were stopped because this data from hospital comes daily and if they are alert and they are looking at the data they will get a measure of what is happening in each district and they can take preventive steps this i have already shown this is how the hospitalization ratio determined in terms of the number of people visiting hospital as compared to the enrollment and it's going up we hope that this will stabilize over a period of time as i said the pent up de demand this is the male female hospitalization ratio i mean we we as i said in the beginning we didn't think that this this is the way it would be but that's how it's panning out in absolute numbers they are they are outnumbering men as a percentage they are far outnumbering their male folks yeah this is one of the government hospitals or not one a number of them that have got money from the insurance companies one distant hospital which i happen to visit uh, got 1 uh, crore would be what 200 million no sorry 200000 uh, dollars they got in the space of just 9 months it has changed the face of that hospital now these public sector hospitals are now competing with private sector hospitals to get the money this is something which we are unable to explain at this point in time we are try to explain you know on the one hand the hospitalization is going up on the other the premium is coming down which which i think will stabilize and one explanation that i've got is that the administrative cost has actually come down dramatically now initially when we started each smart card printer costed 300 3000 $3, today the printer cost 1000 $1, similarly the smart card cost has come down so that is one explanation but i don't think that's the whole explanation I, i i'm not very sure whether we have the full explanation of this but that's that's how it is happening now this is the burnout ratio in the first year the insurance company made a lot of money in the second year in round 1 in round 2 of the districts you see the insurance companies have lost so we would believe that gradually the premium will start going up to balance this out now how is the scheme being perceived if you look at the satisfaction rating we are ourselves amazed in state after state we find a satisfaction rating between 70 and 90% unheard of for government schemes government schemes do not have the satisfaction rating perhaps the explanation is that so far they didn't get anything now they're getting something so they feel satisfied the true evaluation will come in years to follow when they start expecting more from the scheme uh, media has been extremely kind to begin with it was the wall street journal which started it all they sent a team and they found that the scheme was okay then the times of india the local newspaper india today all these newspapers bbc came up with an excellent film on they called it's a winning model uh this is how the scheme is expanding starting with below poverty line now we have building the construction workers domestic workers street vendors and rej beneficiaries all are covered and gradually it is moving up the ladder getting more and more people we had started with secondary care now we are moving down into tertiary care uh, primary care we have done some experiments with some very positive results and tertiary care is being added by the states now future of rspy or smart card we start with rspy we have a common storage area for family demogra demographic details biometric details of rspy family and rspy data here now that we have a chip of 64 kb the next we have taken a decision to convert this insurance card into a health card because this chap goes from one place to the other and the hospital doesn't have the background of this man 
So if you can put some health data there, it would be very useful to them. The challenge here is to identify what can be put in there, who should allow that, be allowed that access because privacy issues are involved, and then how the access will be involved. So all these are being debated and we will certainly do that. Then we are getting into PDS. One state has already started doing it. Now PDS is public distribution system for subsidized food grains and kerosene. And the initial experiments, amazing results, 40% saving in the subsidy. So everyone is very excited, how can we use this card? Life and disability cover, the card that is going to be issued tomorrow in Andhra Pradesh will have this facility along with RSVY. And you have MNRE GA data also coming in. What is not included here ultimately could be education entitlement, where a poor man could be allowed to select a school of his choice and he could be given that entitlement. These are some of the recent developments. We, we are doing some OP projects. We have decided to use this RSBY smart card for other things. PDS, I have already spoken. There are a number of countries that have shown interest. We are engaging with them. I was, it was heartening to hear today that Pakistan has already started uh, something which is modeled on RSBY. They're doing it in one district, and they're planning to expand it elsewhere. And then we've set up this network called Social Security Network for Social Security, wherein we are assisting some of the states to take this forward. What are the lessons? Health insurance can be an instrument for providing healthy care. But it's extremely complex, extremely, extremely complex. We have to be very careful about it. The framework has to be designed carefully, taking into account the ground realities. And technology can be leveraged. It is, indeed can be leveraged. And all stakeholders have to be on board. I believe there is so much to learn from each other. The journey has been so far very exciting, but there is a long distance to travel. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Roop. Um, I think there, there are a number of common uh, uh, cross-cutting issues mentioned. I think one of them, for example, is a, a data issue, inf information flow issue. The other is institutional issue. And then a lot of uh, uh, nuts and bots about the implementation challenges. Uh, without further ado, um, let's open the floor. Um, if you have questions, please come to the microphone. And uh, I'm sure that our two distinguished speakers will you know, more than happy to answer your questions. Okay, thank you very much uh, for uh, your interventions. I'm uh, Abdullah Hassan from the Department of uh, uh, Labor and uh, Social Protection uh, in Morocco. So my question uh, concerns the experience of uh, Turkish uh, on social uh, insurance for the poor. Uh, I'm just wondering why uh, I mean, uh, the poor didn't subscribe, I mean, the first years for the green card, I mean, for this uh, insurance. This is my co first question. You're, you're asking why the poor did not subscribe the green card program initially? Yeah. Thank you. Hold up the question, let's uh, collect the uh, three to five questions and we answer it together. Please. Uh, regarding the, the program in India, I'd like to hear more of how the government chooses the insurance companies, what type of contracting, how many different firms are bidding, and how long their contracts last before they get renewed and evaluated. Thank you. Please. My name is Naveed Akbar. I'm from Pakistan. Uh, my question is about the infrastructure development. Uh, I think health insurance scheme is always like a challenging for uh, every country to launch. 
because of infrastructure. Um, and I especially wanted to ask this question, Anil, that, uh, that how did they manage the infrastructure of the hospitals and um, how they, like in Pakistan, we are facing uh, problems uh, 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 from the supply side, like uh, we didn't have much hospitals or if we have hospitals, the facilities are not as uh, we have in, in, in other developing countries. So how, how did they deal with the infrastructure related issues uh, while implementing this uh, health insurance scheme? This question is to Mr. Sarip. What is the financial aspect of uh, implementation of the scheme? How much it costed and how, how much the expenditure has actually projected and how much, what are the trends? And how is it being financed? What are the burden of it? More questions? I'm Sharad Dawala from Seva, India. My question is to Mr. Swaroop. Uh, sir, uh, this, the uh, insurance companies, what kind of uh, accountability mechanism is there that uh, the private companies actually deliver the, what they promise? And um, uh, given the fact that the, most of the card holders are illiterate and poor and um, migratory in nature, and they are not the aggressive consumers. Okay, that, that, with now we have uh, five questions. I think uh, uh, we, uh, there's one question to, 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 uh, um, ter on Turkish program, and there are, th there are three questions on Indians. Pro uh, okay, four, program, four questions on Indians programs. So uh, can we actually start with uh, Ms. Pen? Thank you for the questions first. So, uh, why was the program was not enlarging at the beginning? So, there was two answer. There is two answer. First, the coverage of the program was not as uh, high as it is expanded after 2003. So, the only uh, inpatient uh, costs were covered. And before 2000s, there were also multiple usage of the cards. We were counting them maybe 2,002.5 million, but they were using the same card in the families, so the number was seen a little bit little. So two questions uh, to, ans uh, to answer. First one is the coverage of the packages, and the second one, uh, miscounting uh, of the numbers. Thanks. Um, the first question was, with regard to the selection of insurance companies. This is done through a tendering process and the district is the unit. Um, to begin with, it was done, being done annually. So they quote a premium for a defined set of services that are to be offered. And the selection process doesn't take much time. Now everything is standardized, in fact. Uh, when they issue a notice, there's 21 days time is given. And once the tender bids are opened, within a week or 10 days, the decisions are taken. Now we have taken a decision to do insurance for three years, having learned a bit in the first three years. So now the insurance would be for three years. So this is not a major issue. The evaluation parameters are also very clearly laid down and fairly objective in nature. And there is a qualification parameter for insurance company to participate. And those qualification parameters are determined by a regulatory authority, which is an independent authority housed in, in Hyderabad itself. They determine they have to be registered with the IRDA, Insurance Regulatory Development Authority, and then they bid. The second question was with regard to how do you get the hospitals? Now, this is a chicken and egg situation. Uh, you don't have a hospital, so you don't put money in the hands of the people. And since there's no money in the hands of the people, there are no hospitals. So you have to break it somewhere and somehow. We were not very sure whether this would work. So when we started the scheme, our aim was not to look at the health infrastructure. Our aim was primarily to put some money in the hands of this guy who would in any case go to some place if he was in trouble. And just to help him out, some money would be available to him. So if he has to travel 200 kilometers, so be it. But at least to the extent of the expenditure that he would incur in whichever available hospital, 
he would have some money. So we were not trying to find all the solutions to all the healthcare problems, but a very limited. But what this scheme did was, and I should have brought it out in my presentation, is that it has incentivized private businesses to set up hospitals in remote areas. Now, if that happens, that will be the real revolution because you are creating health infrastructure where none exists and it is happening in India. A lot of such hospitals are coming. It won't happen overnight. It will take time because let them perceive a business and then they will set up those hospitals. And if it incentivizes the doctors to do what they ought to do, I think half a problem is sorted out in any case because they're supposed to be delivering free health care, which they aren't for some reason. Then what is the annual financial cost? This year we have a budget of 1,500 crores for providing health insurance cover to about 3.4 million families. And uh, it's, it's, it's good budget and we, we are looking at about a billion dollars uh, three, four years down the line when we cover about uh, 60 million families. Uh, to our understanding, it's eminently affordable in a country like ours. I think for the first time in my career, uh, when the budget was to be presented the evening before I got a call from Ministry of Finance and they asked me how much do you want for the scheme. Uh, normally Finance Ministry doesn't do that, which means that they, they also like the scheme for whatever reasons. So that's the financial burden, eminently affordable. But the most interesting bit is, if people are prepared to pay the entire premium under the scheme, then I don't re really need money. So apart from the poor and certain selected segments, if others also want to ride this platform, in fact, ultimately the cost will come down as the numbers will grow. So that's what we're looking at. The last question was very interesting. Uh, what is the accountability of private sector? Because we in this country have two extreme views that uh, you have to be with some bait and going around the private sector people there because they only meant to loot. In this scheme, let me explain this to you. What exactly are we expecting of the insurance company? We are expecting them to issue the smart cards, which they would because they would, won't get the money and they can't issue to a wrong person because of the system that we have. That is one. Number two, they should settle the claims of the hospitals, the legitimate claims of the hospitals. And I didn't mention it, or probably I did. Today, all the claims of the hospitals are being settled within 30 days, 98%. And we have a very interesting arrangement that we don't tell the hospital to settle all the claims. We ask them, you have to take a decision within 30 days. And if you have to reject a particular claim, then you have to give reasons and communicate it to the hospitals. And hospitals have a right to appeal against that at the district forum, which is institutionalized, clearly defined, transparently determined. That district forum takes a call whether that claim was rightly rejected or wrongly rejected and it's working beautifully. Now, this sort of an arrangement will lead to accountability. Now, you are absolutely correct that hospitals are not going to inform the people or the beneficiary about the benefits under the scheme. We expect that, that they won't. They would only inform the beneficiary to come and collect the smart card. So we have a twofold IC management in this. One is before enrollment, which is taken care of by the insurance companies. The other is post enrollment, in which the state nodal agencies engage self-help groups, NGOs, to publicize the scheme. Now, this is one of the biggest challenges that this scheme faces. There are other challenges, but this is also a huge challenge that the scheme faces. Now, what we are trying to do is to engage the existing institutions. For example, in six states of the northeastern, north, northern area and eastern area, Bihar, UP, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, we have an organization called Poorest Area Civil Society. They have in turn engaged SHGs. Now, we are leveraging their presence in the field because they would be certainly be a better communicator than us. I may be able to speak a language that you understand, but certainly I will not be able to communicate with the masses there. These are the guys who are already there. Now, why are they wanting to do RSPY? Because they find value in doing what we are asking them to do. What is the value? They see the impact immediately. It's a visible scheme. Elsewhere, when they do something, it's very difficult to evaluate what is happening. Here, immediately the impact is available, visible. So they are participating in it. As I said, it's not easy. I mean, for me, it's easy to talk. But to get it moving on the ground, but fortunately, things are happening that gives us courage to move further. Let's collect another round of questions, please. I'm still having one more question for, the, for India. Uh, okay, my question is, from what I know, is that the, uh, one of the characteristics of the unorganized sector is the lack of social protection. Is the lack of social protection. So when India has extended social, prote uh, social insurance 
to uh, an organized sector. Did the sector decrease, I mean, the, the, the number of uh, workers in uh, unorganized sector, did it decrease or not? I mean, after, I mean, uh, you extend the social protection to, to them. The, the other question is, does retirement, is the retirement or pension of retirement included in this uh, uh, insurance? Or is it just health insurance? Okay, thank you. Um, yes, hello. Uh, Jana Junghardt from the World Bank. I have a question to Turkey uh, regarding your benefit package. Um, so you said that first you introduced the scheme only focusing on inpatient. So my first question was, uh, would be what was the rationale behind that? And um, the second question now after eight years of experience with uh, including outpatient treatment, um, I would like to know from you what are your experiences in terms of management of, this, of the claims, um, use of the scheme, and also financial implications in terms of sustainability. Thank you. My, Alice, my name is Alice from Kenya. My question goes to the Indian case. And uh, I would like to know who the owners of the insurance companies are. Are they state-owned or are they private-owned? Sorry, can you repeat the second part of the question? The second question? This, oh. uh, the question was, who are the owners of the insurance companies? Are they public or state-owned, or are they owned by private uh, entrepreneurs? Uh, my name is Harim Amlima from Malawi, Minister of Planning. Um, I am not very sure whether I got you correct. In, I mean, the presentation from India. You talked about. Uh, um, doctors getting 25% somewhere. Um, I'm not sure, is this money, share, how is, is it shared? By, does it go into the pockets of the doctors? And the, the other issue is where, what happens with this 5%? How does, how do you look at it? Because I didn't really get you correct, so I want you to, to, uh, to enlighten me on that. Uh, thank you. Let me repeat the question. Let me repeat the question. You're asking uh, how the, this uh, part of the payment uh, to the public doctors be shared to the uh, uh, public doctor themselves? Yes, because you're talking as an about... As incentive. Yes, please. Okay, let's have a, I think there's, we have a, uh, one question to, um, to the Turkey program and the three questions to Indian program. Um, again, that, um, can we start with um, uh, Mr. Kurti Pak? Uh, for the rational for inpatient uh, treatment for green card, um, because inpatient treatment it's more catastrophic for the poor people, so the coverage for only the inpatient to uh, provide more security to, for most poorest ones. And for the outpatient uh, management and financial sustainability, now, uh, while after 2000, Turkey faced financial sustainability and can invest more on social spendings, especially for social protection and also for green card expenditures, it allows us to invest more on this kind of expenditures. So. For these all budgetary issues are financed by national budget. So uh, for our national budget, if you don't have so big problems on financial requirements, so after 2000s, we decreased our budget, def budget deficits. So it's not an important problem for us for sustainable for payments, inpatient and outpatient for green card payments. Thanks. Um. 
Sorry. There has been no formal study to determine the impact on formalization consequent to these social security schemes. But my understanding is I don't think it will have any impact whatsoever. Because formal or informal workers is not determined by what social security the government comes out with. It has other factors like the labor laws in the place, uh, the employer employment, employee relationship. That determines the formal uh, nature of the it has nothing to do with social security. In fact, the whole idea is providing social security is that since there are informal workers, since they don't have formal social security, provide them this social security. Now, RSBY relates only to health insurance, so it's restricted to health insurance. But what is interesting is that since this platform has stabilized, this technology and smart card platform, the other social security schemes are likely to ride on this platform. As I said, tomorrow, for the first time, we are, we are getting a second social security scheme to ride on this platform, which is life and disability cover. And very soon, the national old age pension will also ride on this card. So gradually, they will ride on this platform. Who are the owners of these insurance companies? As I mentioned, of the 14 insurance companies that are actively participating in the schemes, four are public sector insurance companies. There are no other public sector health insurance schemes, uh, uh, companies. All four of them are participating in the scheme and rest of them are private sector and I don't really know who are the owners actually they're private sector uh, I'll, I'll try and find out because that would be interesting to note who owns them then how's the sharing of the incentive done in the hospital this this again uh, we, we grappled with it for a while because we, we did uh, give a stipulation that 25 percent of the money that comes from the insurance company can be shared amongst the doctors now what some states have done is They've worked out exactly of this 25%, 2% will go to this guy, 3 to this, and 4 to this. They've worked out whole detail, who will get what. That's how it gets shared. And it's fairly transparent. Each state has come out, because we can't centrally define as to whether the sweeper will get so much or, or the ward boy will get so much. So the entire team, the states are defining it, they're learning from each other. And I think over a period of time, probably a national standard could be evolved, but as of now, there's no such thing. They distribute the incentives that come to them. Are there more questions from the uh, floor? Uh, I guess this is the last bit, so uh, in this case, I, I don't want to hold you any longer. Uh, thanks for uh, two speakers today uh, uh, giving us a good description of how programs run and what's the lesson uh, for others to learn. Uh, I, um, and thanks for participating.